Um, okay, so let's get started. Who has a question? Anyone? Hi, I'm David, and I, I'm inspired. What's one thing I can do tomorrow or next month to make the world a better place for every sentient being out there? Who wants to tackle that one? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, what I'm going to say is that what, what I've heard a lot today is what, what in sociology we'd call a, a, a voluntarist. That's a kind of voluntarist question. What can I personally do? And I think it's a great question. I'm sure the people on the uh, dais here will have different answers. But uh, what I want to stress is that recycling or eating vegan isn't going to change anything whatsoever. That we're talking about a global juggernaut of capitalism speciesism, and it's destroying everything. And the thought that my, what my little effort's going to do is going to change that is abs it's beyond absurd. So, so we need a political and social movement strategy to overturn these structures of and institutions of oppression. <laughs> Clifton agrees. Oh, OK. <laughs> so anyway, that's, so that, that's, uh, I do think that framing it as what can I do and I understand that we all have to figure out where, where, what our role is, but I do want to highlight that it isn't about changing individual, quote, lifestyles. Or, I mean, that, that's a tiny part of it. It's about, it's about looking into the deep st pathological structures of this civilization. And it's a civilization that needs to be overturned, the whole thing. Uh, and uh, from war and militarism and patriarchy, right? You all agree? Right, OK. Okay, well, I agree with John's uh, argument that we have deep structural changes that we need to make. But at the same time, I would never suggest that we don't have a personal responsibility in our own lives or that what we as individuals do is meaningless. I couldn't agree less with that point of view. And I think that everyone, everyone has to start as sort of in the motto, what is it? Let there be peace and let it begin with me, okay? So it doesn't mean it has to stop with you, but to suggest to you that everything you do personally is useless and that you're just impotent unless you are part of making some uh, huge grand historic change, I think is completely mistaken. And I would never ever tell anybody that because, <laughs> ever, that choosing to be vegan, that choosing to, to shop with cloth bags instead of zillions and trillions of plastic bags, because let's just keep one thing in mind. What are we gonna do about capitalism? Okay, one thing is this. Capitalism and consumerism are two sides of the same economic uh, behavior. Uh, people want stuff. And when you hear people talking about how they're against capitalism, but they still want their smartphones and their widescreen TVs, they want to go to the store and get any n a number of things all the time. Uh, I mean, we are part of the capitalistic system as consumers. So for us to, to tell ourselves that we can't do anything as individuals, um, I think that's, that's the death of resp personal responsibility, and I think it's completely false and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when we are, see our own behavior as, having, as being impotent and having no effect. So I just hope that you will not decide that nothing you do can help. I think Justin has... Uh, so I'm not normally a centrist, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can honestly say that I agree with both positions. Um, I would just say, um, get to know the animals that you're talking about, like, you know, as, as much as you possibly can. Um, I had been vegan for 15 years before I met a chicken. Um, you know, we started rescuing chickens in 2014 and now I'm here. Um, it can be utterly transformative and, and I think it's uh, really informative for us as activists and advocates because too often I think we get caught up in the narrative of veganism and it uh, very often gets detached from the individuals who actually are the whole point of all of this. Right. Um, and so, you know, for me, like my veganism took on so much more 
both personal depth and I think like global significance when I started to be able to ground every single thing that I thought about and spoke about and did as a vegan in the experiences of the chickens living with me. Um, because they're all, you know, chickens everywhere are experiencing these things. And it's great that we can talk about the scale, you know, the billions who are being killed every year and the massive amounts of exploitation. But I think that as a movement, we would benefit from being much more aware of the importance of the individual um, and being able to understand the experiences of the animals who are, you know, suffering um, by our choices and then, you know, uh, grounding our advocacy in a lot that way. So I would highly encourage people to, um, you know, be, become familiar with the many vegan sanctuaries that are around the country and, you know, please consider supporting them um, because despite what you may hear, they're not bad investments. Um, they're um, sanctuaries of all sizes and, and scales are um, really important to the vegan movement and um, I would encourage definitely, you know, look into sanctuaries more and just even if you only follow and like their stuff on, on social media, like, you know, it can be really informative. Okay, great. Got another question. Anywhere over here? Back the corner there? Oh, okay, sure. I'll come up there. I'm tired at this point. <laughs> um, so um, I just wanted to talk more about the importance of uh, sanctuaries. Um, my name is Zephin, and um, someday I want to have a sanctuary of my own, and I want it to be like a really, really big one with a whole bunch of animals. But um, I was just curious, what do the people on the panel think about uh, just normal people, people with like a big backyard adopting um, animals and taking them in? Like, how would someone start doing that yeah well one thing I would say is this now I don't run a great big huge sanctuary but I started as an animal rights advocate working for farm sanctuary when they were still a very small operation in Avondale Pennsylvania and they were a major influence in my decision not only to start United Poultry Concerns as a national organization, but to include a sanctuary for chickens, turkeys, and ducks as an integral part of our work. But one thing I know about running a sanctuary, even as in our case it's a small, you know, 100 birds total, okay? Um, sanctuary work is very, very labor intensive. And it isn't just you, you take in animals. Uh, there is so much labor involved, physical, you've got veterinary care, you've got infrastructure. You've, and I've known so many enthusiastic people who have started sanctuaries. I've been in the movement since 1983, who for one reason or another, eventually uh, they got cancer, uh, they got overwhelmed, they had no help. They were doing all the work themselves. They were in remote areas where uh, they often were in battles with uh, local rural people and f hunting and all that kind of stuff. And, and they couldn't make any money. They couldn't find the money to sustain themselves. And I mean, you have feed costs, you have so many co costs. And no matter how you feel, you have to get up every single day and take care of those animals who are totally dependent upon you. So when somebody says, well, I want to start out and eventually have a great, big, a great big sanctuary, I'd say, you better be thinking even about having a little sanctuary. <laughs> and I'll just mention one other thing. I had a conversation with Jenny Brown last week when I was at a conference in um, uh, uh, Canada. And uh, Jen Jenny Brown is the co-founder of Woodstock Sanctuary in upstate New York. And she, one of the issues she brought up to me that I had not thought about before was her concern about a lot of the micro sanctuaries where people are now t taking in 10 chickens and then getting a 501c3 nonprofit status so that they can collect uh, 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 funds, tax, tax deductible funds. And, and peop most, most average people who want to help animals they don't, they don't know the difference between, let's say, you know, a, a, a bona fide, really, really uh, knowledgeable sanctuary and maybe somebody just basically keeping what amounts to s some backyard chickens and maybe having a pig or so. So the money, the donations that should be going to at least some of the maybe more 
sustainable and, and, and knowledgeable sanctuaries are being diverted to a whole lot of other very small operations where, um, you know, there's just, it's a problem. It's a financial problem that, uh, 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 and a com competition problem that, that Jenny brought to my attention. So it's just something else to say. But I'll just say this too, and then I'll pass the baton here. Um, I got so much out of working as a volunteer intern for Farm Sanctuary back in the mid-1980s. And I still think that to this day they hold their workshops uh, where they help to educate people about what it means to run a, a sanctuary for farmed animals. And, and people need to be willing to be trained. They need to get the best kind of training. And they need to get out there and be an apprentice and decide in advance whether this is really something they can undertake. Because when you take in animals, they're dependent upon you. And I've known people who had the best intentions, but when they can no longer care for those animals, what are they doing? Sometimes they dump them. Sometimes they, they disperse them in one way or another. They're just, they get desperate. They have no money. They're, 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 they're you know, burned out. So this happens, and again, remember, the animals out are at our mercy. What happens to us when they are at our mercy is happening to them. We have choices, they don't have any, okay? So just keep that in mind. I would think, I would, I would think very hard about, and def definitely get that training before you decide that's something you would really want to embark on as a, as a career as, or as a profession. Yeah, I think Justin probably wants, he's, he has a microphone. Yeah, um, so, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, um, my wife and I founded the Micro Sanctuary Movement to help people who are interested the way that you are. Um, but I would actually echo a lot of what Karen said um, in the sense of don't get caught up in, like, I want to be the next animal place. Just, just, don't, just don't do it. Um, <laughs> start small and, and think about only growing in a way that you can handle on based on experience and based on funds that you have. Um, you know, I, a lot of people think that as soon as they rescue a chicken, they need to start asking for donations. Um, you would never do that with a dog or a cat. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's problematic in a number of ways, you know, um, but uh, separate from, you know, funding for sanctuaries in general. But I would just say that, you know, we encourage people to start very small, to self-finance and expect that you'll have to self-finance and only grow based on like actual experience on the ground, not like your grand visions in the head. Because that's actually kind of crippling if you if you just like expect that like the only vision that you have for sanctuary work is running a, you know, a multi-million dollar, hundred acre, multi, you know, hundred animals sanctuary, because most people just aren't gonna be able to do it. Most people aren't gonna be able to do a tenth of that. Um, so it's really important. I think that passion and that interest is wonderful, but start small, expect, expect to self-finance, and super crucial part, become part of a community. Um, the, you know, whether it's the micro-sanctuary movement or other people who are doing rescue work and sanctuary work, um, you know, it's really important to have that sort of support because it is very demanding, uh, intense work. And, uh, you know, there, there are other people out there who are trying to make a difference that way, and I just... I, I really encourage you to, to look at, you know, to look to become part of that community as well um, so that, you know, you can have that sort of support as you try to find ways to, to make an impact. Okay, great. Okay, so, oh, did you want to say something? Sorry, go ahead, Adam. Yeah. So, <clears throat> practical advice, three, I mean, you've heard practical advice, but legal advice, although you're not a client. Okay, <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> take a look at the zoning laws. See if you're even zoned to do what you want to do. Um, you might need a variance. Number two, look at the licensing and permitting laws from animal control. So you're probably going to have two departments. You're going to have planning and development from zoning perspective. And then you're going to have animal control looking at you from a licensing and permitting perspective too. Um, so you're going to have to clear those two hurdles. Then you're going to want to consider your neighbors um, because you're no doubt going to get complaints um, if there's any noise issue or odor issue or whatnot. And you might have a right to farm act or sort of an anti-nuisance or nuisance immunity type act that could help you. Um, so I guess pick your location carefully and run the legal analysis before you get started. Great. We have a question over here. Thanks for a great, a great conference. 
Hey, John, I have a question for you regarding, um, and it was a great talk, uh, and I, I, I noticed, I might be mistaken, but at least through the photographs that you presented, I saw, I didn't see any people of color, so it looked like there was, a, the, the, it was white women who were involved in the femivore movement, and the, the kinds of expressions that you were relating, even when they weren't photographs, are of a certain class, and I'm wondering if you can speak to, you know, we see this as a femivore movement and there's appropriation and usurpation of feminism, but I'm, can you talk to, there's like, seems to be hidden class and race issues in this movement as well, and can you speak to a little bit on that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's very peculiar, but I mean, literally there are dozens of these memoirs and they've been read by millions of women, and, um, I haven't come across any by people of color yet. Uh, maybe there are some, maybe someone knows of them. Um, and also, there's a, I, there was only one working class woman that I could tell. The rest are middle class or even upper class making very good six-figure salaries in Manhattan who, you know, uh, leave, uh, become, you know, from very good jobs to, to do this. And, uh, and that's why, and it's only a kind of hypothesis of mine or theory, but I do think that there's some weird connection with like, sorry, Hillary supporters in a weird <laughs> way, in the sense that uh, Hillary Clinton represented um, for many aspiring uh, middle and upper middle class white women, kind of the final breaking of the glass ceiling. And then, then um, and, and for very good reason, women, a lot of women have been very frustrated that, uh, that she didn't win, you know. Um, but, but Clinton is also a mainstream candidate with a, a war kind of outlook, a you know, very aggressive foreign policy outlook, and that's what made her, in a way, a, a good candidate for, or a, a favored candidate within the Democratic Party apparatus. So I guess what I'm saying is that my, my argument is about a displacement, as I see it, of rage uh, at the limitations of women as a subordinated class in our society, particularly those women who benefited the most from the women's movement, right? Because black women and Latino women and so on did not, have not benefited as much, right, economically and so forth. Um, they don't have that same sense of entitlement and privilege, and therefore they don't have that same sense of rage, maybe? I don't know. I, I can't, I mean, there is a, someone asked me afterwards, well, what, how do you explain the psychology, the perverse psychology? Because here we have, you know, wonderful people in the, in the room and, and uh, alongside me here who are passionately committed to helping animals, right? Uh, and have anger, but they're channeling it for uh, out of compassion. So how do we explain these women who are doing this? And again, I, this is my only, my, my working hypothesis in terms of the appropriation of feminism is that these are women mostly of entitlement, mostly white, okay, uh, who have, who, who feel like maybe they haven't, you know, the corporate world hasn't met their expectations, so they're gonna lean in, if you know the, the Sandberg book. You know, they, but as I, as I joke in my book, you know, they want, they want to lean in, but they want their stakes lean too, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question, but, but, but I, I mean, I'm the, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know anyone else working on this particular issue, and I, I welcome other scholars and people to, to try to explain this bizarre phenomenon. One last thing, though, is I know it, seemed, it was very perverse, all of those stories, uh, and I didn't give you all, all of the great quotes uh, from these memoirs, but what's so strange is that millions of people have read, say, Barbara Kingsolver, and they don't even pick up on the, sad the pure sadism. Uh, you know, like, you can't run away on harvest day is, like, I think the title of a chapter. Like, you know, and there's an ax stuck in a, uh, in a, uh, a uh, wood, you know, whatever. So it's, there's this mocking of, of the suffering and it is tied to, uh, to a white femininity in these, these disturbing ways. Okay, other questions? Thanks. Hi, uh, I just recently paid my taxes and one of the things that infuriates me the most is my tax dollars going to subsidies that benefit the meat and dairy industries. And I'm wondering what is the, the action that any of us could take where we could um, make some progress towards getting rid of those subsidies? Yeah. Good question. 
Anybody? <clears throat> um, hi, nice to meet you. Definitely uh, two words, vote vegan. Um, and, and by that I mean, if you were to go to any of the social media sites that face uh, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, I, I, those are the only ones I know, but I know there's a whole bunch more. Uh, and, and look at some of the collateral that the Humane Party is publishing, what you'll see as common denominator is, you know, vote vegan, vote for candidates that truly represent your values. And remember I brought up, um, in my talk, I brought up that slide where it seems like a daunting task, but if we replace the, the elected officials, um, 400 to be exact. So two thirds, and when you think about how many people are in the United States, 400 is not really a lot. Now granted, it's institutionalized, and, those, and, and, and there's a lot of legacy and tenure and you know, uh, a lot of incumbents um, seated in, in the House of Representatives, seated in Senate. But 400 individuals, people with blood and muscle and, and that are just like you and me, that have happened to just have some influence. So whether it's you running or whether it's people that you know that are running like me or Robert Mason of the Humane Party in Texas or um, Aleg um, Alexandra. Alexandra Byrne, a young lady that's going to be running for state senate in Virginia on the Humane Party ticket. The more people like that that we get into office that truly represent our values, we can address things like dairy subsidies and, and killing, murder subsidies as I call them. I'm on my way. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the diversification today. Everyone brought something so unique, and I really thank you for that. Um, one thing, I'm sure we all want the world to be vegan, and we'd like to see that in our lifetime. However, it's probably not going to happen as soon as we'd like to. This wasn't discussed today, but I'm hoping someone has an opinion on clean meat, and that with you know our fellow omnivores and how that might help in the interim while we're trying to achieve what we'd like to. All right. Karen? <laughs> well, she just re uh, read a book on clean meat. Okay, let me, yes, I'm glad you said that, because here's where I am on this, okay? The, the clean meat, or so-called cellular agriculture, the idea of creating meat in laboratories and creating meat that would, uh, at least hypothetically, not include any actual animals, or at least at some point would not require like a medium in which to grow the, the, the meat, the muscle tissue, which has not been accomplished yet, uh, and then be able to market on a scale that would be able to massively bring down the enormous cost of this flesh that is non-animal flesh, um, I mean, it's not, uh, animals aren't involved, but it's still all the components of their muscles. Um, and then there are the regulatory hurdles with the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, plus all the other uh, comparable uh, 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 government agencies in all the other countries, okay? Those are just some of the things to think about. I just finished <coughs> reading Paul Shapiro's new book, Clean Meat, uh, which has a subtitle to do with revolution, you know, and um, it's very, I recommend it, okay, because even though it has like a ta-da, ta-da, you know, victory sound to the title and subtitle and all that, there's a, there are also all those caveats in the book, you know. Once you read the book, you see there are a lot of, uh, so many issues that would have to be resolved. Um, I'll just say this quickly. I also attended a conference in uh, Canada last week where one of the speakers spoke on the topic of clean, so-called clean meat, um, non-animal based flesh. And uh, he uh, uh, took a very uh, negative uh, position on it. Um, one thing that, for example, uh, P Priscilla Farrell of um, <laughs> Friends for Animals pointed out in a blog recently was, it would be so easy to put actual animal flesh into these restaurant and, and supermarket foods. Who would ever know where it came from? 
It's also been pointed out by many people in our movement. Why the heck are we going to invest ourselves in promoting laboratory meat when we have all this amazing vegan uh, uh, food that most people don't even yet know about? Why are we already giving up on that? Now, I'll just mention one other th idea that is of particular interest to me. Uh, it, I have thought, and others have suggested, uh, that one, you know, that assuming that people feel guilty about the suffering they impose upon animals in order to eat them and their eggs and their, their mammary milk and so forth, um, that if they could have their, their, their meat without having that guilt anymore toward actual animals, they might then be able to f care about chickens and pigs and, and goats freely because they would no longer deny uh, the, 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 the life and the, the value and the feelings and the personalities of those animals which they need to do in order to have them be killed uh, or to kill them themselves. Now, I don't know. I mean, it's just something to think about. Would people be more compassionate towards farm animals if they were not engaged in a guilty bloodletting relationship with them because they would have their meat but without making the animals suffer? These are just some of the issues that I have um, come up, you know, have in encountered or thought about. Justin? Um, yeah, I, I, th I think, I mean, I, I don't really have a whole lot of hope for um, lab meat myself, but one thing that I, I want to consider um, with this is, or two things actually, one, it doesn't really challenge the fundamental problem here, which is the species as commodification of animals. Um, and, I, and I feel that like if we just replace products and we don't challenge that, we're not actually going to solve the underlying problem and people are going to continue to eat real meat one way or another, whether it's you know underground or the black market or whatever. You know, it's an issue. But also too, like that doesn't, that doesn't answer the question about eggs and, and milk and other animal products that people are still, you know, very much attached to. And as long as those are still there, there's going to be dead bodies. Um, just because economically it doesn't make sense to farm these animals and you have to do something with them when they're not economically viable. So if you're keeping chickens for eggs, at some point they don't lay as many eggs or they don't lay any eggs. And if you're a farmer, why would you continue to keep them around at that point? Um, so, you know, I think the, the lab meat, um, answers like one question, which is, well, how do we just stop killing animals for flesh? But that comes with a whole host of other questions that would need to be answered to actually stop, you know, having farmed animals being, being used. So um, I'm not saying that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's out, but I just think that we need to think a lot more about it and not just very specifically about slaughtering animals for, for, for meat for specifically. John? Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a very bad idea for a variety of reasons, and uh, I, I put them in an angry note to Karen, who then put it on her blog. So <laughs> you can if you just Google. No, no, you did. You, no, no, it's great. It's great. But if, you, if you're curious, you can, you can Google my name and, and, uh, and Karen's organization. I think it will come right up. But um, just very, very briefly, uh, the only people I know who are at all enthusiastic about this idea are vegans. I mean, the ordinary people I know have no interest in laboratory-grown meat. And at, at most, it's going to, I mean, and the, and the notion that what's keeping people from, you know, wanting to continue to participate in murder is they just haven't had a good enough product I just think is absurd. They're not, if they don't care enough as it is to go and get these fantastic vegan things that are in the supermarket, and by the way, humans have been eating vegan food for thousands of years, right? Non-animal things are part of every culture, except maybe the Inuit culture, I don't know, but they're, they're, it's just, that's an exception. But um, so, and I just, and I, th I think like the fact that Paul Shapiro and the HSUS, you know, have been interested in this is already to me, it's a sign that, you know, this is kind of this elitist, pro-capitalist, let them free market work it out. It's such bullshit. And it's not, it's so not going to work. And all it's going to do is confuse consumers who are already, you know, well, what's, 
what's real meat and what's... And frankly, if you think about locavorism, the whole reason that that became a billion-dollar industry and made, made John Mackey you know, a fabulously rich man in Whole Foods is because it's marketed as authentic. It's, it's real, you know, that it's a connection to the animals and so forth. So it's like clean meat is going in the opposite direction. People don't want synth synthetic stuff. It's like these, these femivore women, they want an authentic relation in a, in a society where they feel alienated, where they're, we're all just stuck with the machinery of, of and artifacts of our civilization, and people want a connection to the real. So what are you going to do? Well, let's create you know, laboratory meat, and then everyone will eat that. It's like Soylent Green. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, okay, right here. Hi, I think the lab-grown meat is probably preparing for outer space. But um, I really enjoy living here on my wonderful San Francisco Bay Area, California island. But everywhere else in the nation, it, it's not mostly non-West Coast. It's not like this. It's challenging. And I hear from people I know who are vegan and who eat really healthy that just traveling across the United States... It's so hard to find anything healthy to eat. What, what can I do to help, or what can we do to help people in the rest of the country learn about what we've learned about food options here in California? Well, if you were a speaker, why don't you answer? All right. <laughs> Well, I'll just say first that um, I travel a ton, and I never have a problem finding vegan food. Um, you know, you, 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 uh, yeah. I mean, it, you, um, you kind of just have to know what to look for. Any Chinese restaurant's going to have vegetables, tofu, and rice. Um, even at the airport, you find what's that? Well, you need to, to communicate with the, with the wait staff, but you know, uh, you can find vegan food out there. Happycow.com, happy cow, woo, happy cow. Uh, happy cow's amazing. Um, if you don't know, it's a, a website and an app that you put in the, the zip code and it'll tell you what uh, is uh, vegan friendly in, in the area you're in. So um, there's a lot of resources out there. I think that um, you know people that travel, you know, it's, it's, it's not that hard. It's really not. And people that are in other places, even um, I was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and thought, oh, I'm not going to find anything here. And the health food store had, like, vegan muffins. And, you know, we found amazing food in Louisville, Kentucky. So um, it's really spreading everywhere, and that's really beautiful. Um, yeah. Anybody I, else? Yeah, well, I would just say quickly that uh, we're based in a very rural area, as I said. This is owned by the poultry industry on the Lower Eastern Shore of Virginia. But our local supermarket is Food Lion. Um, they have a wide variety of all vegan foods, okay? And uh, my sanctuary assistant um, was saying, well, you know, he decided to try out this little local uh, 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 store, you know, uh, uh, a restaurant that's for the local people. Uh, I've never even dreamed of walking in there, you know, <laughs> ever, and never would have dreamed that there would be anything to eat in there at all, because it's all like seafood and everything, you know? Um, and chicken, but, um, but Jonathan, my sanctuary helper, said, well, you know, when he was taking care of our birds, he decided to just check this place out, and he said, and lo and behold, on their menu, that it, their menu includes vegetarian chili, totally vegan chili, and he said, it's, it's delicious. So you have to be, you know, that you have to look, you have to be proactive, and uh, like Hope, you know, I've traveled for decades, and I've never had, a chi I've never had any problem eating anywhere I went, and it, including the Midwest. You want to yeah, real quick. Um, I, and I'd like to add to that. There was a, a young man named Matthew James Luck who I ended up meeting on social media when I ran for president. And he's a, a fantastic young man. And I always see him traveling all around. Um, he, he, like he's in Texas one day in, in New York and then down in Florida and then he got in a car accident somewhere. And, um, and then I'm noticing he's, he starts all these groups like the couch surfer group and um, and, and the reason why I'm bringing him up is because he'll call ahead of time or he'll contact someone in a vegan group ahead of time. That's one thing you can do. And then also, this, this is off topic, but you'll see why I'm mentioning this to you. I was watching a, a movie starring Eddie Murphy um, about two weeks ago. It's called The Golden Child. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. <clears throat> so funny. And um, they kidnapped this little boy who's like this Buddhist monk, but he's the next savior of that town. 
and, and they put him in this cage and then they surround him by all these people and they don't give him any food to weaken him. And then he pulls out this little teeny flower packed with all this stuff and he plucks off a leaf and he eats it. And it just reminded me that how resilient our bodies are. And so I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to say that I think if you uh, plan ahead and take your, you know, your vegan survival pack, I do that a lot on airplanes. And then um, also Andy Mars, I don't know if you guys know Andy Mars, he's um, dedicated to helping children be vegan and maintain a vegan lifestyle. He really helps even adults prepare for when we travel. So just wanted to throw that out there to you. Hi there, thank you so much for today. I've just, we, we drove up from LA and it's just been tremendous. So thank you all. Yeah, we'll be here next year for sure. So um, uh, I've got a question, maybe best at Clinton, but of course everyone's welcome to, to, to sort of jump into it. Um, last year I became an, an American citizen because I felt compelled to do so due to sort of that, the reality buffoon that has sort of got elected and I just couldn't quite wrap my head around it because I really believe in this country. And so I've been thinking about getting into politics. And then off the back of your speech, I was like, bloody hell, I'm so inspired. Like, ah! <laughs> and then, and then, and then I, I felt that familiar sort of like vacillation between, but what if I, what if I did and I'd be honored to, but then what, if, what would, well, how would, how would you say, Clinton, that I reconcile sort of, sort of this, this question that I have of, but if I do that, then is it one less person sort of to get you know, sort of him out or them out. Sorry, it's not very eloquent, but... Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, uh, that, that's a great question, and, and thank you. I'm glad you were inspired. Um, that is what uh, I, I ran for, is to let people know that there, there's no office too big. It's a constitutional right for us to be able to run for office. Um, it, it's just gotten to the point where it's so monetized and, you know, uh, there's this one-party system that boasts that it's two parties, but it's really, in my opinion, a one-party system. And um, I don't think you need to reconcile anything because when you think about it, most of the time that people get angry about their vote for a quote-unquote third party is because that person shared their vote with them. Your vote is like your hair. You know, um, I don't have to tell you that I comb my hair this morning, but if I'm courteous enough to sh share with you that I, I combed my hair this morning and then you have an opinion on it, um, I don't see why people have an opinion on it. Secondly, I have some data substantiated but not, not only the Humane Party, but it's, it's national voting data that a lot of people were undecided or independent and did not contribute to Donald Trump winning. It was the people that voted for Donald Trump that got him to win in the key states that won the electoral votes. So there, I don't, I, I don't feel that you should reconcile anything. And I think that um, uh, what you're doing, if you do that, it, it's brave, and it's even brave for you to think about it. And I salute you. Yes, we need more vegans running for office. Do it. All right, right here. So my question is sort of along the same lines of hers. Um, the San Francisco, yeah, we have like so much opportunity for fresh food and a lot of people here don't experience food deserts, but what do you say should happen in those areas where there are food deserts, where there isn't any fresh fruits or vegetables around? Um, I would, I'll, I'll speak to that real quick. Um, let me put a plug in for one of my favorite uh, initiatives out there, which is Grow Where You Are. Um, they're based in Atlanta, um, and they are totally veganic, um, really just am amazing, amazing um, uh, uh, activists who are started out with an urban veganic farm, and you know now they have a larger property, I think, outside of Atlanta. Does but everyone know what veganic is? Maybe you could explain veganic, just briefly. Um, it's, it's doing um, agriculture, gardening, larger scale agriculture without any animal inputs. Um, so no manure, no fish meal. I think um, Adam blood mentioned no, no blood meal, no bone yeah. meal. Yeah. Um, well, actually, they found that the best um, fertilizer materials. is like is a uh, composted straw and hay. Um, actually, is much richer source of uh, nutrients than animal manure. There's some great 
there's great material out there. There's a whole Facebook group for veganic permaculture and stuff like that I highly recommend. But Grow Where You Are is really wonderful because they were working in a food desert and um, creating like community-based, uh, like, you know, vegan agriculture and food support programs. Um, another one I would suggest looking into is, um, they have several different groups, but Thrive Baltimore, I think is, um, is like one of the main ones. They've created like a community kitchen in Baltimore City um, creating vegan food for the community. They've developed like their own ve uh, vegan cheese. They did a vegan mac and cheese smackdown that's been going on for several years now. Um, so I think, I think you know, there's, there are activists working on the grassroots level to address the, gra the, the food desert problem and, and getting food there. And so I'd love for the vegan movement to be more aware of that and to help spread the knowledge because, you know, you never know what, um, who will be sparked to, to do something seeing other people who are already doing it. Um, and uh, so definitely Thrive Baltimore and Grow Where You Are um, out of Atlanta are two that I would highly recommend for, um, for, for addressing that issue and community-based food programs that are also vegan. Great. Okay, cool. All right, I see Mike. Now, uh, we were instructed that uh, we're supposed to concentrate on uh, things that were mentioned today, so maybe I'm going to transgress here. I'm kind of surprised I haven't heard any mention, I don't recall, about local legislation. And uh, there's some local legislation that has been very important. Um, in, uh, in Berkeley, and I believe in San Francisco, there have been ordinances passed to outlaw fur. Uh, but the huge example is uh, city ordinances uh, outlawing use of bull hooks on elephants, which were passed in Los Angeles and then in Oakland, and it was those ordinances that led to um, Ringling Brothers Circus uh, putting aside elephants, uh, which is a, a wonderful, great thing. Uh, now, also, local activists here are talking up the idea of uh, uh, a local initiative in the city of Berkeley to ban meat in Berkeley. Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, most, so I, I, I'll just say this. I'm the only one here that's actually from the Bay Area. So this panel all flew in from other states. So that's probably why you're not hearing about local stuff. Um, but the reason that we do that, I'll just say, is because you rarely get to hear from these voices. We always hear from the local voices. So that's what this conference is about, is to find the voices all across the US. So that's kind of why local stuff wasn't focused on as much. Actually, though, you're Sacramento. Yeah, yeah Sacramento. He's Sacramento. And, and I actually did participate in uh, the, the, ban, the, the march to ban fur. In, in Berkeley, and it was really important to me because I actually attended the University of California, Berkeley. So the, uh, the group that actually started writing the city council, um, the mayor, I think, at that time, and I came out to speak, and I do think that those grassroots movements are really important. Um, it just so happens, though, at the Humane Party, we're trying to write national laws, but that is not to say that the local laws, the municipalities are not important as well. Very, Absolutely. very important. And I'm proud of that effort. Another question? Right here? Well, next. <laughs> this question is for John. Uh, carnivores eat meat, herbivores eat grass, locavores eat locally, yet you use the word femivore, which would cause one to think we're eating women. And so I ask you, did you create that term, or where did that term come from? Well, if it's locavore, you can't eat a local. Is it not Thank eating a you, local? Hope. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I, there were so many things I, I left out of the talk. But um, you may have noticed there was a New York Times magazine article about. Uh, um, can uh, chicken save the desperate housewife? And, and it was at that column, I believe, in the magazine where they coined the, 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 the word uh, femivore to describe women in the carnal locavore movement. So I did not invent that term, and you are technically right. Very, very few locavores eat women. I just want to make that very clear. Because people on, you know, this will be out going out broadcast, and I don't want people to get the wrong impression. Okay, all right, another question over here, who was it? 
okay, okay, all right, well, over here. All right, all right. <laughs> Hi, it's a question for all of the it's so easy to be a vegan uh, people. Okay. Uh, there, it's, a, it's a matter of that not everyone in the room agrees. It's easy. No, it's not easy. Uh, you're going to have a difference of opinion. Now, related to what we heard today, we saw some faunalytics data. There are more X vegans there are more ex vegetarians than there are vegans and vegetarians i'd like to hear from it's so easy to be a vegan people how can we retain veganism better in this country well i'll i'll just i'll, I'll say that I, I i think that a lot of what the recession or the you know people going back is, is um, lack of social support, lack of community, not necessarily lack of vegan food. Um, so, you know, uh, I think it's important really for us to connect, to uh, have social support, because often when you go vegan, you know, suddenly your friends, your family, everyone around you is not, and you don't have that support. Uh, so I think that's a critical piece. Justin? I mean, I'm not an it's so easy to be vegan person. I'm actually the opposite. Um, I would just say that I think, so I've been vegan for 19 years. Uh, my 19th vegan anniversary was just earlier this week. Um, but I've seen such a, a tremendous growth in the, pre the prevalence and predominance of veganism. But I don't think that we should substitute the growth in vegan products with an actual growth in like, veganism and the values of veganism and vegan culture, I think that's still a huge challenge. Um, and personally, like, I, I understand why, you know, people starting to eat vegan products and buy vegan things every now and then is, is, is a movement forward. But I also think that, like, you know, people who um, don't understand the ethical foundations of veganism are the ones who are going to relapse, if you want to call it that, whatever term you want to put to it. So I think that, you know, we can't mistake having more vegan products on the shelf with an actual, like, you know, uh, truly valuable growth in veganism as, a, as an ethical movement. Um, and so I think it's just really important, you know, that we make sure that we don't get caught up in the capitalist appropriation of veganism um, and that we keep a, an emphasis on value. Is there a different system that isn't capitalism where animals are treated better? Yes. Follow us, and we, we follow us. We need we need a new system, and no, there hasn't. I mean, is there a anarchism in ancient China is where animals got more respect? All right. Well, do you want to answer the question then? Yes, yes. It's okay. The the, the, let's, the, let's an, let John. the answer is I mean no not the answer but I mean it, it's it's I agree with what you were just saying about you know diversification of food systems or food choices is not to be equated with you know enlightenment in the culture and that, that's kind of what I'm trying to say I don't think personally I don't describe myself as a vegan as the first thing because ve people think of it you use the word lifestyle actually which is a word I never use it's not a li like the reason I'm against violence against women it's not my lifestyle I'm not against racism because that happens to my lifestyle I respect your lifestyle you're racist no <laughs> It's, and it's not even an ethical question. It's a political question. It's a social justice question. And in fact, the people, the, the fair weather vegans and vegetarians who then jump, and now they're like Molly Katzen. I, I didn't get a chance to uh, quote her tonight. I was going to uh, today. But Molly Katzen wrote, of course, the Moosewood Cookbook. And now she's chastising the vegetarians and saying, well, I was never pro-vegetarian per se. And you have all these people who are now eating meat who were supposedly vegetarians who just never really got it in the sense that they didn't care about the violence. See, this is a question of violence, and that has to be the issue. It isn't a question of food preferences, food choices, uh, ethics, in the same way that the Holocaust wasn't about ethics. It wasn't a problem of Kantian ethics. It was about murder, and it's about, it's about violence, and it's about justice. And, that, and the animal rights movement, um, you know, parts of it have just not a done, done a good enough job on, at that. Uh, and also, of course, people don't want to hear that. But that, to me, seems to be the message. Let me just really quickly. Um, the two women I showed in my presentation, Natalie and Meredith, uh, they're both ex-vegans. So it's definitely a, it's definitely a thing. 
Okay, we have just about six more minutes, so a couple more questions. Yeah, I was just going to oh, say yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Karen. Um, I think it's a very complicated issue, and it's a very depressing s situation, but we have to keep you know, charging forward as best we can. Um, I do think that a big reason um, many people try veganism, but then they revert to the way they used to eat, I don't think there's any question that, first of all, they, if they cared about, if they learned something about how animals suffer, and they, they're, they're momentarily very moved by that. But then they're absorbed back into the world they came from. And the world they came from is just like everything around, the mo for the most part, is non-vegan. And okay, they want to get along with their family. They don't want to fight with their children. Th they want to go to a restaurant with their, work, with their coworkers. They don't want to have meals and eating be an issue. People want a meal to be where you relax, you feel comfortable, you relieve stress, et cetera. So when veganism becomes an issue, now the meal is an issue. And now it's a place of stress, just like every other place. And again, I think it's the ambience in which most people live, certainly to this day, where it's not a vegan world. And it's just so easy to just revert to what's comfortable, what everybody else is doing, what makes it so easy to say, well, just go, you know, and then you, you like, Benjamin Franklin said, he was a vegetarian for a long time until he was on a ship, he says, and uh, they were cooking fish. And he said, the fish smelt mighty good. And he said, like he wanted to eat a piece of fish because it, it was being fried and it smelled good. So he said, well, so I had to justify this. So he said, when they were cutting open the fish, he said, I saw there were smaller fish in the bigger fish, inside the bigger fish. He said, so therefore, I rationalized to myself that if you eat each other, therefore, I should have, it's okay for me to eat you. But then he said, the point is, it is so easy for human beings to rationalize what they want to do. He said, man can come up with any excuse to do, like my nose was smelling the fish, so I had to come up with an argument to myself that would justify myself not being vegetarian anymore, but eating the fish on this voyage. That's what he said. Okay, another question. There are no vegan products in Argentina. You have to go out of your way to buy tofu. And I just saw Earthlings and I went vegan the next day and I think it's, I'm one of those who actually thinks it's easy because I even had friends who came from the Bay Area to visit Argentina to go to Antarctica. Af one month after I was vegan, they wanted to go of course for the beef because that's so famous. And I went to the restaurant with them but I ordered spinach and mushrooms and it was fine. You know, if you really want to do it, there are ways, even in Argentina. And they don't have anything in the frozen food section or anything like we have here in Berkeley. And it's doable. And it's easy, I think. All right. Any other questions? Sure. This question is for you, John, but if anybody else wants to answer it, whatever. You talked a lot about how in the time of war movement, it's mainly... Uh, white women of a certain socioeconomic level, and yet when I look around this room, you know, in a state that's, you know, practically minority majority, I don't see a lot of people of color here, and I'm wondering what can we do differently to attract more people of color? Yes, you, sir. That's a great question, um, and there are various activists, uh, well, like Breeze, Breeze Harper, uh, and, uh, and, and um, people in what's called critical animal studies who are working on this very topic. And it is, it is of concern. Um, and there's a lot of kind of sociology about why it is that uh, white middle class people tend to make up the movement. Um, <laughs> in terms of changing that, uh, I think that um, trying to ally this movement with other movements would really be helpful. Uh, and, as, and I've tried to, I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying about capitalism and so forth, that this is not, this is just one tentacle, well, I hate to use that as an animal metaphor, but it's one aspect of a larger totality of violence that is human, uh, contemporary human culture, right? And so violence against animals is the main one, in my view, and the, the, the bedrock for everything else, but, but uh, if we're for anti, we're, we're against the oppression of animals, then we have to be for the Me Too movement, and we have to be for the Black Lives movement. 
and frankly, if people see that we're walking the walk, right, and that we are, we are there for them. Now, it's a long road, to, or a long road to hoe, because in fact, people are speciesist in the, on the left. I mean, sometimes they think that the left is more speciesist than, than the right. Um, but we, I think that that's, the, that's one answer, is that we need to um, form alliances and, and show solidarity with other movements. I don't know if anyone else has any. Yeah, um, so I'm really fortunate that I've, I've had a, the chance to work with some um, amazing uh, black vegans. So I really encourage you to check out Black Vegans Rock. Um, uh, Af and, AFCO started it, and um, she's doing amazing work to, to really highlight the work that's actually already being done by black vegans and other vegans of color. So it's, and, and she really uh, helped me to learn a lot that, like, I think we're kind of approaching it in the wrong way sometimes when we think about bringing more vegans of like people of color into the vegan movement rather than recognizing that there's so much work already being done um, by people in the black in the you know the black vegan community um, and instead of you know trying to make them part of our movement it's about recognizing the work that they're doing and you know so I, I just I, I'd like to, to re re recommend that project to people but also kind of just a mentality um, comment that sometimes like if we think like this is it and we need to bring people into it we may be thinking about it the wrong way great. okay well it is six o'clock so we're going to have to wrap it up thank you for holding out all this time i think we had an incredible high caliber of speakers this year let's give them a round of applause <laughs>